So I'm thrilled to introduce our final panel of the day um, and our final panel of the forum. Uh, so far, we've, we've looked at, the, at this question of how higher education can meet future demands of the workplace through the lens of employers and through the lens of higher education. However, we know that there is a persistent gap between what employers are looking for and what higher education is delivering. Um, so our aim with this forum is, was really to bring together these two sides of the coin that don't always speak um, very well with each other. Um, with that in mind, our final panel incorporates a third perspective, uh, that of nonprofits, foundations, and associations that work across higher education and employers uh, to develop programs and solutions across the sectors. So I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. We have Janet Chen, who is director at the Business Higher Education Forum, uh, Ross Weiner, who's vice president and executive director of the Education and Society Program at the Aspen Institute, uh, Laverne Srinivasan is Vice President of the National Program and Program Director of Education at the Carnegie, Carnegie Corporation of New York. Mary Alice McCarthy is Director of the Center of Education um, and Skills at New America. And our moderator, I'm happy to uh, have join us, is Paul Fain from Inside Higher Ed, who's written extensively on the pathways between education and work. So I'll turn it over to you, Paul. Great. Hello, all. Um, so I'm just going to start with a bit of a softball uh, to let folks talk a little bit about what they're doing, um, in, in particular to, to help close the gap. So let's start with Mary Alice, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a brief primer on your work these days. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, um, thank you to um, UPSIA and to Columbia School for Professional Studies for the opportunity to be here. It's been a great uh, series of conversations. Um, so yes, my name is Mary Alice McCarthy and I direct the Center on Education and Skills at New America. It sits in our larger education policy program, but we focus specifically on the intersection between sort of higher education policy, our workforce development um, policies and practices, and our career and technical education system. And in particular, we do spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, we do a lot of work with community colleges and a lot of work with sort of thinking about job training programs and in particular apprenticeships. I've been um, struck by how often apprenticeships has come up today, so I'd be very happy to talk about our, our uh, national apprenticeship system and, and how I think it could be better leveraged to support students. But I will say, and just as a, just as a comment before passing on, I would say from my perspective as a policy person and as someone sort of very focused on community colleges um, and uh, sort of um, other forms of job training and workforce development, my sense is that the challenge we're facing isn't so much about how institutions like Columbia University and our generally almost all of our four-year um, public and, and private universities are preparing students for the future. I think they're actually doing a fantastic job. Um, and I think if we look at, we know that because our college graduates, uh, particularly our bachelor degree graduates, are doing very well. It's, it's the folks who don't make it into these institutions, and it's the folks who don't make it to the finish line of our universities that are struggling the most, and for whom we have not developed yet a good, robust set of other options that meet them uh, where they are, either where they are in terms of their age or where they are in terms of their interests. And so maybe I can talk more about that as we move along, because that's a lot of what we're focused on. Great. Laverne? Terrific. Um, so I won't reiterate some of what Mary Alice said, but from our perspective, there you know, is a longstanding issue of public education actually not being designed to prepare all kids to attend higher ed and higher ed not being prepared to receive all children. And so from our, you'll see on your tables, there's a report that we released last September about how the system is essentially highly fragmented and it's a call for greater coherence. So not surprisingly, our point of view on this is historically, as Mary Alice noted, we have had a portfolio and post-secondary pathways that is focused on uh, community colleges uh, and the extent to which courses in community college, remedial courses, aren't well serving kids for a whole variety of reasons, which we can talk about some more later. And then the access and success at the, the traditional four-year colleges isn't what we would want it to be for institutions other than 
than institutions like Columbia. So the question becomes, what could we do better in that realm, which we had been addressing? In the last year, we have pivoted that portfolio to focus more on understanding what are the flexible pathways. We think about them as on and off ramps for the kids that are not making it to this type of four-year institution. What does that look like? And, and to Mary Alice's point, they're not all children, right? They're, we're talking about adults of varying ages as well. So we're, we're focused on that, and then we're focused on this issue of, in the end, we don't think the solution is just about how can higher ed connect better to business, but actually how can we build a continuous uh, viewpoint and engagement from essentially cradle to career. And that's something that I don't think our system is well designed to do. It's designed to operate in silos. And those silos are problematic from a policy standpoint, from a K-12 and a higher ed and a, and, a, and a business sector standpoint. So I'll talk some more about the things that we're thinking about in that respect later. Ross? Great. So um, I, too, just want to uh, thank UPSIA and, and Columbia for inviting me to participate. I, my focus, I run the Education and Society program at the Aspen Institute, really focused on pre-K through 12 education, so we'll bring that perspective into this conversation. And two things that we're focused on that seem especially relevant to these conversations, um, one, we just uh, finished sponsoring a national commission on social, emotional, and academic development, and that, that idea that the future of work is going to demand more social and emotional skills, more adaptability, more teamwork has certainly come up a lot in these conversations. Um, I think it was really interesting. One of the things I think a lot about is um, how we assess learning and development, and right now uh, we really only assess sort of academic skills in a fairly technical, narrow sense, and it's come up a couple of times on the last panel in particular just talking about how we create opportunities for students to do more meaningful work that uh, exercises those skills and then how we think about uh, credentialing that and, and giving them opportunities to sort of put those competencies forward and, and, and make sure they can articulate that value that they can create uh, is one thing uh, that I think is, is really relevant and lots of work to do across K-12 higher ed. Um, and I think one of the things just related to that, one of the things that's come up a couple of times is employers, the challenge of employers clearly articulating what it is they need. I feel like actually there's lots of ways in which employers have articulated this need. It comes up in lots of surveys and you see it coming from the World Bank and the World Economic Forum, this value on social emotional skills. What we haven't seen actually, employers have been a huge force in education policy reform over the last decades and they haven't found as clear a voice um, in the need to really transform public education, uh, to really build these skills, to build them in all students, not just um, sort of for, for some. So we could talk more about that. The second uh, dimension that we're really focused on with lots of relevance here is the equity dimension. Um, I was struck by the data that Jonathan Law uh, shared at the beginning of yesterday's conversation, in particular, that black Americans are going to be most, uh, are likely to be most affected by automation, have the most job losses. And so just thinking about whose responsibility is it to address that and what's the role of K-12 higher education and government, which maybe hasn't come up as much in these conversations. The other dimension of equity that I think is um, really um, relevant and, and much less present in the conversation is the growing gender gap in, in degree attainment. Women are, are uh, getting many more uh, degrees than men and also s demonstrating stronger uh, adaptive skills, stronger ability, uh, sort of uh, teamwork skills, some of the things that our employers are saying are valued. So there's just portends huge social change and social challenges and how are we thinking about um, managing that for the benefit of, of society generally feels like a conversation we need to be having. Good points, and I think uh, I think we're probably going to get into some other gender gaps and some degree credentials as well. Uh, I could see Mary Alice taking a note there. Uh, <laughs> Janet. Yeah. Thank you, um, and thank you for UPSIA and Columbia for inviting me as well. I've really enjoyed the conversations that have been had in this room um, and getting to know everyone. So. In terms of who I am, I'm a director at the Business Higher Education Forum. Uh, we are a nonprofit membership organization of CEOs and university presidents um, who use market intelligence to build business higher education partnerships and also to help align higher education to the needs of today for digital skills talent. 
Um, so one of our umbrella initiatives, which we launched in 2012, was the National Higher Education and Workforce Initiative. Um, it's where we have developed over three dozen business higher education partnerships and over 50 new credentials in digital skills. And um, I'll, one of the main things that have come out from that work are the models that we use to build those partnerships. So um, one is the strategic business engagement model where we encourage companies to exercise five levers to engage with institutions and they include corporate leadership, corporate philanthropy, employee engagement, um, core competencies and expertise as well as funded research. And so I'm um, trying to move partnerships from kind of a transactional relationship where they may only come to the institution for on-campus recruiting and trying to make it a more strategic, ongoing relationship. Um, and building on that, we also have our partnership implementation process, which is an eight-step process by which we serve as a facilitator for the partnership, um, starting with doing an analysis of the job landscape and market in a particular region to understand the needs, um, moving partners through uh, the development and launch of a new program or pathway, and then um, ultimately resulting in changed hiring practices for the companies. So I can talk more about that later, but um, that's just a brief overview of what we've done. Great. Uh, you know, so part of what I do is try to discern how much of a problem we're talking about um, or, or whether, you know, we live in, a, in an era where everything's either totally broken or totally great. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, I, I don't cover elite higher education very often. Um, but I think to some extent it's, it's gotten in my head a little bit that maybe, maybe uh, highly selective institutions aren't attentive enough about vocational skills and jobs. And then I met, I know there's some Michigan people here, so I'm not kissing up to you. Um, but I met with some folks from your College of Liberal Arts the other day, and it blew my mind. I mean, the preparation for jobs is really good. You know, if, if you go to Michigan, you're going to have micro internships and in finance in uh, New York, and you're going to go to Silicon. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not really worried about that piece of it, to, to your point. Um, but there are some real problems. Uh, obviously, um, not just demographic shifts and the uh, academic preparation of students, uh, the uh, public financing. Uh, we talked, we heard in the last panel about state disinvestment, but uh, you know, the default rates, um, African American borrowers after 12 years, 50% default. So some real problems that need to be fixed. But you know, when I think about the gap, and you all work on the gap, um, you know, it's really hard for me to get a sense of, is it really the sort of thing where Colleges have been going through the motions and have advisory boards of employers who come in and once a year or, or twice a year talk about things and then nothing happens. And, and on the other side of it, you know, I talk to the chamber folks a lot, are the signaling problems that employers have, the uh, HR not being in tune with the C-suite and, and, and what sort of skills they need, you know, or, or are we looking at... Uh, real change across the system, just maybe not enough um, in trying to identify what works and what doesn't. Let's, let's start with Janet, since you're, you literally straddle the gap. I mean, how bad is it and how much progress have we made? So yeah, I'm happy to take that question. So um, in our partnership implementation process, I think one of the key outcomes is that we want to be able to make sure that the companies are actually signaling property in their job posting language. So um, we, once a program has been launched, employers often will reassess what they've been posting in their jobs, and that is a positive outcome of the partnerships that we've created. Um, we also kind of encourage companies to think about other ways to engage with the program. So a lot of our work is on work-based learning and high impact practices and how can they um, use the resources that they have to kind of continuously engage and make sure that um, they are developing the talent that they want to see come out of the program. Um, and so that's uh, something that's really been a part of our work and we try to emphasize in all of our partnerships um, with higher, higher education. Sure. Um, Ross, do you, you have any thoughts on the, the scope of the problem here? Yeah, I guess just um, two quick reflections on sort of um, 
things that manifest in K-12 that I think probably uh, go across the, the ecosystem. One is just um, being much more intentional about giving students awareness and exposure to what work opportunities are. Um, and so being with employers being on job sites, um, just having those experiences, whether it's through uh, something as formal as an intern, uh, an apprenticeship or internships or just other ways of bringing that into their life. The other is back to um, this sense of really understanding what employers want and again, engaging students in meaningful work. And I think we've got a real challenge certainly in K-12, and I think it probably comes in, it's come up in some of the conversations about teaching discipline uh, versus sort of teaching more adaptable skills. Um, we have a, a, a sense of sequencing that you have to focus on technical skills and on academic skills first, and you have to master those before you get to do sort of richer work that's more, speaks more to your own purpose and, and builds more adaptable skills. And I think we really just have to um, really mix that up and recognize students they really do need both of those things, and they're actually deeply complementary um, in practice. But that means de um, sort of developing and 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 developing teachers and, and faculty on delivering pedagogy, delivering instruction, in just a very different way. And so that's um, just a I think a big shift that's going to need to work through both K twelve and higher ed. Sure, the other panelists, you know, I, if if. The skepticism of the existence of a skills gap is warranted, and it certainly feels like it is at this point, uh, to me at least. But um, an information gap seems like that's a real thing. I mean, do you all agree that students aren't being exposed to opportunities early enough and with enough detail to, to kind of chart, chart their path? No, no dissent there. No dissent. <laughs> <laughs> no dissent. Do you want me to comment? Yeah, sure. If you, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think our, you know, as I intimated before, I, I think there is a very big gap in that regard. And unfortunately, to Ross's point, I think it starts again far before you get to higher ed, um, especially for the sciences and some of the other disciplines. If we do not, I mean, the research shows if you do not gather, I mean, get, uh, get attention from middle school students in an interest in science at that point, then it's probably a lost cause to think that they are going to pursue any of the STEM careers, or it's not highly likely. Um, you know, some of the data around mathematics as a barrier course, even for kids entering community college, I mean, some of the things that we have supported from the Car for the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Dana Center are around how you build co-requisite models that better meet students' needs with, you know, with with you know with math ways, quant way, and stat way, uh, you now see kids achieving and, and completing mathematics and and uh, courses at the rate of 50, 64, and 67 percent, respectively, as the as opposed to five percent in traditional remedial mathematics courses. So I think that we have to start sooner. I think that is also the place where you get experiential learning, the kinds of things that Ross was talking about. Again, we think need to be more interdisciplinary and integrated much earlier on. And those experiences and apprenticeships, which I'm sure Mary Alice can talk to, need to start long before you get to higher ed. When you get to higher ed, you know, an organization like Transform forming post-secondary education in mathematics, which is one of our grantees, is looking at the field, the discipline of mathematics at the lower division and the upper division levels and trying to understand how do they differentiate the coursework available to students early on and think about what they need both academically and social emotionally aligned to the needs of, of employers. So I think there are a number of things we need to do, but for sure it's the skills, uh, cognitive, non-cognitive, I know a lot of people don't like that and I don't love it either, but it's, it's, the, it's the mixture of, of those social emotional learning skills as well as the academic skills, the experiences. And quite frankly, we're not going to pull that off either if K-12 teachers and faculty at higher ed don't actually know or are exploring and understanding those uh, the mix of those skills and academic needs for aligned to careers, right? That's not how most people have been prepared to be either a K-12 teacher or uh, necessarily the what's been required as a faculty member in higher ed depending on where you are. So I, I will, I'll leave it at that. 
Mary Alice, you want to respond to that? Yeah, and I, I would just yeah double down on, on all of that and uh, agree that I think the bigger problem that, that the problem I'm more concerned about is the information gap because we have a higher education system that is organized fundamentally around choice. Students choose where to go, and, and you know it's sort of a taken as a given that we're not supposed to try to push them into certain things. We want them to choose, and yet we don't invest in, in good systems, um, particularly for high school students, but really also for adults. Um, in helping them really make good choices. And I mean, I think if there's one robust finding that comes out over and over again from um, so that, you know, the, the sort of evaluation studies of community college programs, of high school programs, higher ed, is that coaching and career navigation have a tremendous impact. People make better choices, and, um, and, and then they are more likely to complete. Because that's the other side of the coin, is we have a choice-based system and for some of our students, a bad choice is what ends up getting into a bad program that, is, that they often don't complete, because um, it's very hard to complete a rigorous four-year degree if you realize it was the wrong thing and you really wish you'd never done it. But it's a lot easier to do that, too, if you don't come from a, a you know, if you come from a, a well-resourced background or to pivot in the middle or to just um, um, sort of get through it. But, but. Um, the consequences of poor choices for our vulnerable students are potentially very, very large. Um, and so as a result, it's a really risky, risky system. Um, the other thing, though, too, is that with the career exposure, I, again, we sort of, we've gotten so focused on preparing students for the academic transition into higher education that we kind of have, you know, I think overdone it, a lot of people say, and sort of cloistered them in high schools mm -hmm. um, so that they're not necessarily aware of what's going on. We are, um, my organization is, um, um, just this year launched a, a, a multi-year uh, um, uh, initiative. We're working with a whole bunch of different uh, organizations and national partners um, called the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. And it is um, um, working with, um, we're working with nine communities um, across the country to um, make apprenticeship opportunities. These are formal work-based learning opportunities available for high school students that bridge into college and will culminate, ideally, in a college degree. But again, and it's, this is trying to get at the issue of not only do we not necessarily help students make good choices, but for students who aren't necessarily interested in, in moving right into an academically rigorous mm -hmm. bachelor's degrees, but really want to have that hands-on experience and, and do that sort of thing, we, um, we send them into sort of different programs at community colleges. They might be applied associate degree programs, or we just sort of don't really have any good options for them. And I think a lot of my research focuses on how we could build different pathways that continue to lead to the bachelor's degree which is a really important floor in our economy. Um, and if you don't get, you know, it's a ceiling and a floor, and if you don't get, on, you know, over and onto it, onto that platform, you know, we have a lot of data that says you are very vulnerable to, to things happening in the labor market. We need to create more ways to get to that bachelor's degree. So we need to be a little bit more open about what are the learning pathways that lead to it. So we are also doing a lot of work on how an apprenticeship can start in high school or start in college and lead to a bachelor's degree. How do we allow those community colleges, those applied associate degrees at community colleges, build on those so that you can get an applied bachelor's degree or better connect them to bachelor's degree pathways. Um, that, that's not the kind of stuff that Columbia University is necessarily doing, but it is, um, it's a big missing part of our system. I'll just say one last thing is just, if we look at other countries that are, are, that are much more successful at sort of transitioning young people into employment and, and keeping them in employment, they generally have university systems that um, take in sort of 30, 40 percent of the cohort. And highly high-performing vocational systems that take in as much as 50, 60, 70 percent of the cohort. But those vocational systems are high quality, and they don't end at high school, or they don't end at an associate degree. They continue on into the polytechnic. They continue into master's degree programs. They continue into applied universities. We have the structures here in this country of those systems, our Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education System, our National Apprenticeship System, but we barely fund them and, we, and students are unaware of them and we essentially don't leverage them meaningfully and we could do a lot more to do that. Uh, it's a great setup for my next question. I, um, I was thinking about what you were saying about uh, other countries versus this country yes. and how I, I met with a German manufacturing uh, conglomerate that was doing some apprenticeship work, and I was a little late, 
it didn't, didn't go over so well. Uh, it's a very different country uh, when it comes to <laughs> slightly late journals. Um, <laughs> but but uh, anyhow, um, so, but, uh, you know, I want to talk about choice here and becoming more prescriptive with vocational options earlier and what uh, the, the really serious equity challenges I think that raises in terms of tracking. Um, uh, you know, obviously we have a, an increasingly diverse student population coming up and a lot, for good reason, a lot of folks are trying to expose uh, people at an earlier age to career tracks that, where there are jobs, but how do you balance that with the kind of separate but unequal systems that frankly we already have in a de facto sense? But um, let's start with Ross on that, and not everybody has to respond to that one, but given your K-12 focus. Um, so that is a, a massive challenge, and I think um, we're building on a legacy that is one of, of um, in, injustice and inequity, and, and so, and, and the, that's not so long ago. So I think it's also, you know, there's lots of, of new ideas that hold a lot of promise on the table, um, and yet there's also communities and, and families who have lived through that not working out. Uh, very well for them at all. And so how do we build trust? How do we build systems that really are more fair? I, I'm, I also am struck by these international examples and I think we have a system that's built on much more choice, much more access. You, anything is open to you. Um, it, that's the narrative. And yet we have less social mobility uh, and we're declining uh, relative to other countries, both in social and economic mobility and in attainment uh, of those degrees. So we're doing something. We, we have our own narrative that's not actually true and it's not really no. working. Really? So, 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 and that is, that is a real, uh, um, a, a very profound challenge. I do think um, getting more um, exposure, figuring out how we let more students um, really get to express their interests in high school. I think we still have a very rigid, um, you know, you need to accrue a, a certain number of Carnegie units in this and this and this. Um, and, and, and one of the things I thought about, um, because we also have a huge equity problem on the front end of the education system uh, in early childhood, right. which we're challenged to figure out how do we make high quality universally uh, accessible. And one of the things I've been wondering about, I've heard floating around, it's certainly not something I made up, but should we be thinking more uh, about encouraging students uh, to, you know, that high school really ought to be, the modality of it ought to be three years. That, that a year of national service or community service ought to be the norm. I think we could actually figure out how colleges and employers started to value that much more um, and, and potentially reinvest that money in early childhood mm -hmm. uh, education, which would have, over the long term, a huge positive effect. Sure. Um, Jan, it looked like you wanted to add in on that, or, or no? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, just I, do, I have just, another question to you. So. And I do think, though, that, um, yeah, the, the, the issue of choice, it is a, it's sort of um, baked into our DNA, I think, as Americans, too. Yeah. It's a really yeah. difficult one, and there is um, um, a lot of reason to be concerned around anybody um, sort of getting steered one way or the other. I will say one of the... Um, sort of most uh, active sort of movements in the community college world right now that is you know gathering a lot of evidence of its effectiveness is something called guided pathways mm -hmm. and again it's just this importance of like when students go into these institutions that they have more, much more help and much more structure of like if you if you want to end up here this is the series of courses that you take mm -hmm. and and so that you don't wander off into courses because we, we really right. have a system that allows people to wander around for a long time I had uh, Travis Rindle from the Gates Foundation I saw yesterday, and he said there's a big difference between exploration and being lost. Yeah. <laughs> Which yeah. I really like. uh, Ross? Just, just um, one other quick thing, and it'll uh, just bring back a note that I sounded earlier around. It's very interesting how much the, the push towards um, stackable credentials, and, and it really is around technical skills. And I worry sometimes about fairly narrow technical skills that actually might be outdated fairly soon. So also getting clearer about in these guided pathways, again, how to both change the pedagogy and the experience of making sure you're working on a team and that you're building those skills. How do you lead a team? How do you navigate uh, situations of diversity? How do you create value out of pluralism? Things that are gonna be really valuable in the workplace and I, I don't know that we're as intentional as we need to be 
about building those in and then about sort of selling that value proposition both to students and to employers about this is why you should have students from our program. And again, I just think huge equity uh, considerations there when you think about what students get at Michigan, that kind of yep. stewarding through the process versus, well, we'll give you this, this very narrow, very discreet credential and good right. luck. Um, last question before we open it up, I do, I do want to ask one here. So I, I feel like, you know, Tony Carnevale uh, from Georgetown talks a lot about what sounds like a version of what you described, Ross, of transforming to a K-14 system would solve some of the equity concerns around tracking. But, I, you know, I also feel like stackability is, off, is a very important piece of ensuring that students start somewhere but end up with that bachelor floor. And I worry when I write about stackability if it's feasible, if you know medical assistants really are going to come back and work toward that nursing credential when they're working, they have two kids. You know, um, do, do, are you all optimistic that higher education and employers can really make stackability work? And um, Janet, you want to take that one? Sure. So um, we actually have an example of that. So um, we work with Miami-Dade College and Next Era Energy on a partnership uh, for stackable credentials. Um, they uh, go from high school associate's degrees, bachelor's degrees, to um, a, a master's degree in data science. And so um, this is a, a model that we've been very proud of in terms of actually meeting the regional workforce needs of data science, but also it's, um, it's an innovative model. Um, it's one of the first that was introduced in the state, and um, we've found that it's been very successful. Um, we've worked with the Miami-Dade staff and then the president to kind of push this movement forward, and I think the leadership at the institution, but also all of their partners have really come together to you know, make sure that it, this has been successful and that um, the students are being hired out of these programs. And this is a utility, right? Uh, Next Energy, is that what it's called? Or? Next Era Energy. Yeah, I actually was on a panel with them and I uh, was so impressed at the level of involvement by the employer. And then I forgot to write about it and now maybe Goldie and I both can, but it was a really good stackable. Uh, any, anyone else want to answer? Yeah, it? I just, I was trying to think, you know, coming into this about where are there are examples that are promising. And I think that the examples that are promising are when I've seen uh, the involvement of policymakers, higher ed, and, and, the, and the work world, uh, the business sector. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, I think, is attempting to do some things that are promising, uh, that really do involve, you know, so it's somewhat spearheaded by a community college leader, but it really deeply involving the business sector in, in sort of having a local, regional, community-based understanding of what is needed for jobs in that area and how K-12 and higher ed can align to help meet that need and how can policy align to support that. And I think there's some interesting things going on in Dallas and Nashville and other places. Um, so I think there are examples out there. I think stackability is something that will work if it's not pursued in isolation. Mm -hmm. In other mm -hmm. words, if it's pursued as a programmatic mm -hmm. solution that is, you know, sort of pioneered in places, it, it, it's not going to have the stakeholder both demand, understanding, and engagement across all of, of the sectors that need to be engaged in order for it to work. So think, I think the, one of the biggest flaws to success of innovative ideas in this field is really poor design and implementation. The right. ideas are fine, right. but, but, but the design and implementation don't meet the challenge of the complexity of the system. You know, I know in one piece of the Columbus State, working with Honda and some of the right. big distribution, distribution jobs at Amazon, is the labor market data. I mean, they know what the jobs are, exactly and I have a feeling that that's not always the case. Um, and I, yes, yeah, I just want to really, you know, echo everything you just said. And, and again, stackable credentials is is something that um, we think a lot about, and and it's very aspirational, and we want it to work. But it it uh, there are a lot of risks associated mm -hmm. with it, um, and I think you have to be really intentional, and you really have to think through a whole set of supports. I think the biggest risk with stackable credentials is creating the the first step on the stack being a very short-term certificate program that isn't actually, it's a stable 
thing to stand on where somebody can't really make a living off of that. Um, and it's, we allow institutions of higher education to build that, that uh, certificate program. You know, it's, it's fundable through Pell and through our loan programs. And students want to believe that if they can just get that 15 week or six month certificate that they'll be okay, then they start working. And if they don't have the kinds of supports that you're talking about, they have a very difficult time. So the research we have on stackable credentials is that they, they don't tend to work from the certificate, when they start at the certificate level. Mm -hmm. And I think the only time that they do is if they're part of a very robust workforce partnership mm -hmm. where the person is able to combine work and learning and that the employer supports them in the next step of the pathway. You know, we didn't even talk about uh, pot potential shifts to public funding options, but maybe we'll get to that in the Q&A. So now is the time for you all to, to join us in this conversation. I see, I see one from the journalist. Um, <laughs> Mike's coming your way. Yeah, this is one I did remember to write. Um, there's Clark Gilbert from BYU-Idaho has been really pushing this, effort, this program he calls Certificate First. Um, so this isn't a question, but he's trying to build a whole movement around this notion of start with the certificate, build students' confidence, and go on from there. That might be just a point of information for people to check out. As a momentum point piece. Yeah. yeah. Others, don't be shy. I've got lots of other questions, so you don't want to get me started. Well, oh, okay, I see one in the back there. Hi, I'm Andrew Hansen from Strata Education Network. Um, this conversation around credentials, I'm curious, I was just in a meeting with Mary Alice earlier this week where a claim was made that there are like 780,000 different credentials out there, aside from the fact that if I have a credential and you have that same credential, there's still variation between our workforce outcomes. So from the employer lens, how do we, how do we what do we think of uh, how they make sense of this, this wild west of credentials, as it's been called? And I'd really love to hear from you all, if you could design a credentialing system from scratch, what might that look like? Because I feel like we're getting to this point where there's this credential explosion, and you alluded to this, Mary Alice, where we're credentialing these sort of like discrete skills that actually can't, you can't take into the labor market and get a, a good job. And so what, what is the value of having those? I'd love to hear the, the thoughts from the panel. You want to take that one on first? <laughs> <laughs> sure, go for it. Laverne, please. Um, I think it goes a little bit to what I was saying previously, which is you, know, you have to design for the outcome that you want. And if the outcome that you want is a very discrete set of skills, uh, that's going to have also a very discrete life span to it. Um, I think that Mary Alice's point is incredibly important that if you are building a foundation for students, you cannot build it on something quite that small. But much like the idea of the guided pathways, that if you have a perspective on what a suite of skills look like, what, what, is, a, what is a stack of skills, it goes back to your information point, understanding if you're stacking, <laughs> what you're stacking toward and what is possible with as you, as you progress along that pathway, I think is really important. Um, the supports, is, so it, it's you can't just do that in isolation. And while I think there is a value to building confidence, I think we have other strategies around how to build that confidence in students in a variety of ways, not the least of which is we could do a much better job of it at the higher ed level in the first place, right? So I think you know having students uh, experience programs like the one that I mentioned earlier or many others that have come up around sort of co-requisite and what it means and the supports around those academic pathways that also build in other skill development are the way to go. Um, I think stackable credentials will be important when we actually have better perspectives uh, and representations of how they stack towards something over time. 
that's my Mary Alice. I, I would just add that one thing too that I think is important to distinguish around all, there's just a lot of new credentials being created and institutions of higher education are creating a lot of credentials and businesses actually are also creating a lot of credentials. So, and then private entities are creating credentials. So they're coming from all over the place. I think it's important from a, I'm putting my policy hat on so I'm, I'll just be the government here. Um, you know, we want to think about what, which of these credentials are, are can be supported through public funding. Um, so I think we need to know things like, is the point of the credential for it to serve as a momentum point? In which case, if it's just a momentum point, then then there needs to be momentum, you know, and we, we better watch whether or not the person continues or just feels good, and that's not enough. And then if it's supposed to be a workforce credential, like an occupational credential, again, then we need to track whether or not it actually has any, any um, uh, real value in the, any cachet in the labor market. I do think the state of Florida has been doing a really good job of maintaining a list of uh, certification specifically that they follow through their labor market data to see whether or not they, they you know, are in, you know, employers are demanding them and then there are good jobs associated with them. So I do think there's a role for, for at least for state governments, I would say there's a role for federal government, but I think there's a role for federal government in everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> and are you, you talking about credential engines estimate on, yeah, I, worth looking at the work they're doing. Talk about trying to boil the ocean, wow. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna piggyback on that real quick though uh, with the Tower of Babel question. You know, um, you were talking about employers creating their own credentials. I was thinking about the Google IT cert. It's my favorite example these days. So if you, everybody know about the Google IT certificate? Yeah, really fascinating. I, we just had their new enrollment numbers and they're very high. Um, they started with 40,000 and it's, 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 it's growing. But you know, Google has determined that it can set the skills and the competencies for an entry level IT job because it's Google and it's a nation state and it can do whatever it wants and everyone else will go along with them. And, and I don't mean to pick on them, I mean they, they got sign in on from a lot of other companies and it, it, they, they might be able to do this. But if, if you're doing a more competency based, shorter term credential at a local level, does it transfer? I mean, is there portability? Who should be defining competencies? And do we need some standardization of the language? Um, I mean, nobody, I think, has figured that one out. But <laughs> do you think there's a role for the federal government or accreditors or uh, somebody? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I tried to avoid it. Anyone want to take on that, that piece? Janet, you so I think the... Uh, the idea of the common language is really important um, when we're working with uh, business and higher education partners, kind of putting them in the same room to develop a competency map of the knowledge, skills, and abilities that they're looking for in, in the job candidates that they'd like to hire. So um, that's something that we do. We, we hold workshops um, where we kind of bring the partners together and we facilitate the conversation. You know, uh, the different words that are used where business partners may use the word competency, a higher education partner may just talk about learning objectives. You know, it's about um, kind of making sure everyone's on the same page about um, roles and expectations for the partnership and the outcomes that they hope to see. Um, I think going back to kind of the credentialing um, idea as well, um, when we think about the academic vehicle that the partners may agree on to, to be the best kind of pathway that they would like to create, um, we, you know, we want them to think about uh, the, whether their institution is able to adopt a very flexible and innovative new pathway you know, the speed with which the, the pathway is created because we know that these fields are evolving very rapidly and then um, whether the credentials are will be industry recognized, which I think is what we're trying to get at is that the, the credentials really, we want them to be recognized by employers, we want them to be hiring these students and so um, that's something that we always look for when we're, we're creating these. Anyone else? Tower of Babel, anyone? <laughs> That's a tough one. All right, uh, other questions in the audience? We've got it all figured out. I know I feel more confused myself. <laughs> it's right here. Um, in our last session, uh, we our conversation sort of uh, veered off into into for a little bit um, funding models and how you know how we can support sort of these innovative programs and bringing you know different higher education institutions together and um, higher education institutions and employers together. So I'd be interested to hear from the panelists about any examples or um, 
Yeah, any examples or um, partnerships you've been involved in where you've seen some funding models that, that work? Mary Alice, you wanna? I, I will talk a little bit about um, some of the work that we're doing on apprenticeship because one of the reasons we're really excited about apprenticeship um, is that it really leverages employer investment um, in a way too though that we think um, is also creates a lot of opportunities for students and doesn't uh, lock them into anything. So just to be clear, when, when I say apprenticeship, I'm sort of referring to our formal registered apprenticeship system, which actually has a code of federal regulations that, that sort of specify what it is. But, but specifically what it includes is a, a certain amount of um, on-the-job learning that is paid, and then a certain amount of classroom-based learning that happens at a, 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 a usually at a, often at a community college or some sort of labor management partnership. Um, and these programs have to be sort of registered, which means that the, the, a state agency or the federal government goes out and, and looks and makes sure that all those things are happening. And what's exciting about them, though, is that in places like North Carolina, for example, and South Carolina that are doing a lot of this, um, both at the high school and the college level, this means that employers are, are, being, are willing to sort of pay to bring in a, an, a, often a young person or maybe a community college, you know, a young adult, and pay them to learn on the job. Okay, so that's a really great way of leveraging private sector investment in a very targeted way. But that, but that apprentice isn't only just learning that firm specific set of skills. The employer is also paying for them, or in some cases like North Carolina, the state is paying for them to go to the community college and take general coursework that does culminate in, a, in an associate's degree. So it's sort of the best of, the bo of both worlds. We're leveraging uh, the employer investment. In the case of North Carolina, we're leveraging the state who pays the community college to deliver these courses to the apprentices. And then sometimes there, there might be some sort of federal, um, you know, that apprentices might qualify for certain um, um, federal programs as well. But it's a new way of bringing, it's a, it's a true public-private partnership in skills development, and we'd like to see a lot more of that. Do you want to just real quickly talk about what's in store potentially for industry Recognized? Right. Well, so I will say um, uh, there is a um, so the Trump the Obama administration apprenticeship has sort of been in the air for the last couple of years. The Obama administration made some big historic investments and tried to sort of jumpstart the conversation. The Trump administration has also been very interested in apprenticeship. Agreement. But they, <laughs> they don't like the existing apprenticeship system and are working to create a different one um, that is significantly less regulated, uh, that doesn't have to abide by the, the, the current Code of Federal Regulations, and that doesn't necessarily have to have any time links around it, um, and all of the sort of quality controls are, 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 is able to sort of potentially get around what we would consider to be some of the critical quality controls around the length and the quality of the program and also how, the, how and whether the apprentice is paid. Um, although they do, the apprentice would be paid, but potentially through some different mechanisms. Um, under our current system of registered apprentice, uh, apprenticeship, you know, the program does need to be at least a year long. It can be competency-based. But an apprentice is entitled to wage gains as they make their way through their program because the whole model is premised on the idea of as you are more productive and contribute more to the firm's bottom line by being more productive, you get paid more. That's a really important principle. It's a really important labor market principle, a really important equity principle. Um, so we are watching that very carefully. Um, you know, stay tuned. Uh, we're expecting some new announcements from the Department of Labor or the White House any day now. They're from, uh, I guess, it's, yeah, from the Department of Labor. Yep. Yeah. Over. Yeah. I'll just underscore the public-private partnership thing. I think that the, those models are going to be very promising here in New York. Um, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Jamie Dimon obviously feels strongly about that, and they've made investments here. There's a project called Here to Here um, that's that's launched and, and well underway, and so and that is, that's at the high school level. Um, they're launching CareerWise New York, I think, just launched here recently, and there's CareerWise Colorado actually as well. So trying to build those pathways in terms of. Funding. Um, in addition to that, I think you know, since I'm on the panel, I'll say, <laughs> the role of philanthropy I think that can be helpful in this is you know, for example, we support PIA. We support uh, you know, we're, we're, we can support sort of innovation in these spaces. And then Carnegie's view on this is we try to use 
use our platform, if you will, to bring people together. So literally, as we sit here back at my office, <laughs> there is a, a meeting just like this happening with folks uh, just like you, except for they span you know, K-12, higher ed, and the business sector um, that we're launching, I mean, that we're hosting right now. And, and so creating more opportunities to bring folks together around that, problem solve together around these issues. We include governors in those conversations as well because of these equity issues. We don't want to go off creating pathways that we wouldn't send our own children down. Um, so I, I, I would just say that, that I think public-private partnerships are important. I think that Philanthropy needs to play a role in helping to build the sort of networks and connective tissue that allow for this collective problem solving that hopefully will design better cross-cutting solutions than can be done by the business sector alone or just the business sector in higher ed would be what I would offer. I think, uh, for the microphone, I think there's a question over here. And while, while you make your way over there, I, I think J.P. Morgan also announced like $350 million in community college employer, so yeah, substantial philanthropy happening. So Ross, this is a question more for you. There's a, a blame game that continues to cycle, so maybe you can help demystify it, right? So, so we'll talk about Google. So Google is one of our corporate partners, and Google will say to us often, you, Columbia, are not providing us with the talent that we need of skilled workers in particular disciplines, coding, data science, et cetera. You're not giving us what we need, so we're going to do it ourselves by getting our certificate. Then we say to the New York Department of Education or Los Angeles Unified School District, you all are not giving us the talent that we need to be able to train them, to give them uh, to Google. So we're having to go to other countries increasingly to get students who are better prepared at the K-12 mm -hmm. equivalent level to come to our school. But then Google's saying, we have a where are your US students and they don't have the right skills. So whose fault is it and <laughs> whose responsibility is it to prepare K-12 to students specifically in the United States for the disciplines and the skill development that are needed by the companies that are looking for it? Uh, so I certainly hope my fellow panelists actually have an answer to this. I will give you a little bit, but uh, that's a pretty big question. I think a couple of reflections. One of the things I've been thinking about in this conversation is actually the news this week that Google announced it was going to spend a billion dollars uh, or invest a billion dollars. It's, it's kind of, conf uh, I'm not clear how it's going to be structured for affordable housing in the Bay Area. Uh, follows on a similar commitment, $500 million by Microsoft in Seattle around affordable housing. So the, the reason I'm saying that is because we have, um, I mean, we, the, the amount of inequality and insecurity that we let people live with in this country has a profound impact on, on, on learning, on how much um, students, young people, and families can invest in their own learning. And we are, we, we are paying a price for that, and, and we're unwilling to really grapple with um, that, the, the, the level of, um, of inequality that we allow here. Um, and we're out, we are now outsourcing dealing with those things to Google and Microsoft, and that, that just does not seem um, sustainable or certainly like it is going to achieve fairness. Uh, and, 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 and equity in our society. So that's one, and because then, it, then it's also the investment in early childhood education. Uh, it's unbelievable, the difference in those opportunities. So, and then I would just say, I mean, look, K-12 has a lot of work to do, and I think there is a similar challenge for, for K-12 and higher education of, they were built, right, in the first instance, K-12 was really built around very basic skills. Um, and college was built around serving of, you know, just sort of uh, a small sector of society. We want to serve, we, we want to be excellent for, for everyone now. And that is both noble and essential for economic growth. Um, but we have not grappled with what does that mean? We're saying basically, could everybody just sort of fit into a system that was actually designed to work for relatively few? So it really does mean transforming the education system. And I, I, I've already mentioned, I do think part of it is thinking differently about how do we tap into the intrinsic motivation of every young person. And it does mean really situating learning much more things that they care about in their communities, being culturally responsive, being a, just really rethinking how do we have students doing work that is meaningful to them mm -hmm. and valuable in the world. I mean, no, no employer 
it, it, employers often are giving performance assessments now. They're rarely giving just a standardized test. Like, could you tell us just these very discrete facts? Do you know them? And yet, that is actually very much how K-12 is still structured. So, huge changes. Those are some of the things, or challenges, uh, some of the things I think we need to address. Yeah, go for it. I can't help it. <laughs> We're all to blame. <laughs> That's who's to blame. We're all to blame. I, I mean, we, we, I won't repeat everything that Ross just said, but I will double click on that as we've noted. Look, we have a system that's designed for a, complete, a completely different age, a K-12 system. We know that if we prepare children better from birth, essentially, with the number of words that middle income folks get, that when they enter their pre-K uh, learning experiences, they are better prepared. So, we basically have a system of what I like to call full remediation from beginning to end. You start in your education system with remediation and then depending on your zip code and where you were born and the inequities in our system, it's designed basically to remediate you end to end. And then we do the same thing for teachers as well. Um, it's, 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 it's destined to not actually meet the 21st century need and a shift in needing more than 45% of the adult population in this country to have a bachelor's degree. So if you want a different result, you have to design it differently, You have to, and we have to invest differently, which means what is it we were, Mary Alice and I were just talking before the panel started, you know, the folks that we task with supporting or taking care of our children zero to three, you know, are, are at those critical, at that critical point or if people want to talk about return on investment, you invest there, and then you don't have to spend the next, you know, 12 years remediating children, right? You, you, you start with a strong foundation, and you work from there. And then some of the more innovative ideas that we have have much more potential for impact. So I, I guess what I would say is the system is not well designed. On the promising side, we know a lot. We actually know a lot more than we did 30 years ago. You know, using the science of learning and development and understanding how to scaffold and build learning for kids differently than what we had been doing in an era where everyone didn't need to be college and career ready. Look, we did a great job. Everyone now thinks they need to be college ready, except that we actually haven't prepared them to be college ready. I like to say we're graduating kids at a higher rate from high school, but we're failing them at scale by the time they get to higher ed. We can't ask higher ed to completely, you know, then start that process remediating for what didn't happen at K-12 and then the business sector now trying to correct for that. So I, I think we have to have the will, demand, talk about information for people to understand how we need to work differently in this country if what we really want is 80% of folks to have a bachelor's degree or some type of credentialing and skilling that allows us to meet 21st century work needs. Um, it, questions out there? I've got a comment while the microphone moves your way, so thank you. So I, I, you're talking about early childhood, and I was just talking to a university president about, uh, you know, the Trump administration has moved towards releasing, and already has, uh, program level outcomes data, which is new and pretty exciting stuff if you're interested in accountability in higher education, and the earnings data is coming soon. Uh, so you'll be able to see how early childhood programs perform in the market. The answer is not good, and people are cutting them as a result. Because and if, that's what we do. And, you know, right? medical assistance, early childhood, like we don't have a system that literally can support those jobs. And I don't know where you, you talk about where to lay the blame, and where do you start with that? Well, the, I'm sorry, one last thing. <laughs> you got me on my... On my I, we are talking about work of the future, the future of work. We need to design and support an education workforce that meets the needs that we are asking them to be able to have for students, both academically and social emotionally. And we, we're not doing that. We, we don't have an educator workforce strategy. What we have is a strategy for how we're going to support kids Right, well, that's yeah. what we're working to. But what about adults? It's, it's student experience and adult capacity at the end of the day that have to be married together in, in the right context under the right conditions and with the right supports to get the outcome that we want. We're not gonna get it otherwise. Great, yes, I, I agree. Um, so Mary Alice, I'm gonna put you on the spot one more time uh, in terms of public funding. I, we were talking before about 
the fact that Congress, with the, the strong backing of this administration and lots of others, uh, is contemplating a fundamental shift to the Pell Grant program. And we, f we both feel like people aren't maybe paying close enough attention to that. Do you want to give a little bit of a primer on what's going on and what you think about it? I'd love to. Thank you. And, and I think it is very relevant to this conversation because I think one of our most important programs that has provided access to higher education for low-income Americans for since, since 1965 when it was created was the Pell Grant program. And, um, and figuring out where Pell Grant dollars go is very important to, and has a tr tremendous uh, impact on um, what's, you know, where students go and where they enroll. There is, uh, there, there are, you know, as part of uh, the higher education reauthorization, the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, there is interest in maybe creating more flexibility with the Pell Grant program. A lot of different groups are interested in that. There's one particular proposal um, that is called the Jobs Act on the House, on the Senate side, and, and there's conversations happening on the House side, that would um, um, take the eligibility requirements for the programs from their current time requirements of 15 weeks and bring those down to eight week certificate programs and also make Pell Grants available for what we call non-credit programs. These are programs that are often developed, some of them are delivered by extension schools, mm -hmm. often they're delivered at uh, community colleges on the workforce division side. And they don't necessarily require um, college level credentials or you know they're usually for jobs that don't require college credentials and things like truck driving or welding. And again, sometimes they're very good jobs. Other times they're, they're very uh, not good jobs, things like um, home health aid and office assistance and things like that. So this is a very significant change. I, it's a very well-intentioned. These are people who I, many of whom I know and we're having lots of conversations who really want to sort of figure out how to give people more access to uh, the labor market and people who are locked out of the labor market, how to give them more access to job training. Um, at the same time, though, it raises all sorts of equity issues about how are we using our signature program designed to help low-income Americans complete college to support very short-term job training. It's a naughty, complicated issue, but it is one that the higher education system that, you know, the, the, the four-year institutions don't seem to be paying much attention to, and I think we're sort of wondering why. Um, and, and we're distressed by that um, because I think um, one of the things that we've been seeing over the last decade is that our four-year public institutions are becoming more expensive and more selective and have fewer and fewer Pell Grant students in them. And, um, and it's very important that institutions like Columbia and like our public flagships and our four years think about how to better serve Pell eligible students and get them to the finish line. And this particular move to make it available for even shorter term programs could potentially, could potentially help people connect to good jobs, but also creates a lot of risks. And tell me if I'm wrong, maybe this is the journalistic cynic in me, but thinking about Pell as being a $30 billion a year program or so, yeah. probably a zero sum game if you're moving billions of dollars out. Is that something that you worry about? I, what, what I think one of the reasons this bill is sort of popular is it, it doesn't require any new spend. It's, it's, Funding for job training that doesn't require any new f funding, um, right, because we're going to take money from one program and put right. it over the other. And right now we have a Pell surplus, so there's right. also not a real sense of urgency. But that's not always going to be true. So we're going to find ourselves at some point in the situation, if these extensions and eligibility are made, then when we have to sort of say, oh, there's not enough money to go around, who doesn't get it? And is it going to be the folks in the job training programs? Is it going to be the folks going to four years? No. Right. And those are going to be tough conversations. Anyone else want to respond on that? I have a lightning round question. If not, we're down to a couple. So uh, thinking about the future of work, um, let's assume that the latest news coverage of the increasing possibility of a recession in the next year is true. How does that change what you're, what you're focused on? Um, does it change the urgency in, in ways that maybe we wouldn't think of? Um, something, something that you're all tracking? Let's start. Uh, uh, actually, Janet, do you have, is that, does, is, is the forum looking at that? Yeah, so um, I think you're right. The, there's a potential for a recession as we, in the next few years. And so um, I think, I'm not sure it really changes how we approach our work. So um, we're still going to focus on building these partnerships and building new pathways. Um, I think uh, as we move forward, um, We'll, we'll be thinking about how do, we, how do we meet the regional talent needs in a way that, that will evolve with the economy and um, in a speed with which it will be meeting the needs 
of today. Um, so it's about kind of the speed with which we create it, the, the flexibility with which we create it. Um, I think we will continue to do our work as we've always done it, whether it's a recession or not. Um, but uh, it certainly does put a little bit more urgency in terms of getting the talent um, into the jobs that are um, going to make them successful. Well, a more responsive system could respond more quickly in a recession, one would hope. Um, uh, Ross, do you? Um, I, you know, public education funding has just actually recently rebounded from the Great Recession. Um, and in a number of states, it hasn't. Teacher salaries uh, have been really flat. We've seen teachers walk out in, in you know, um, in, in a number of states in the last year. We, we've heard in this conversation several times about the disinvestment in higher education as well. So these things are very fragile. And I think, it, you know, it goes back to having just abdicated on a lot of large public policy issues around how uh, the future of work plays out. Does it really serve everybody? And that will get, those equity issues will get more acute um, in a recession. And, and, and I worry, I mean, what we need is leadership. We need voices. One of the things that I think about when I think about the higher education community is what a voice, what a voice of um, sort of moral clarity that's been in the history of our country mm -hmm. and how little, in part because of the cross pressures higher education is feeling, how little it feels like there's the room for higher education leaders to play that role right now and we need it. We need it to reemerge from higher education and we need it to come from, from other leaders as well. Anyone else? A last thought? Um, well, if not, I hope you'll join me in giving a hand of applause to our panelists. Well, thank you all. I think this, um, from all your comments that I've heard throughout this past day and a half, I think this has been a very engaging uh, forum for everybody. So I really appreciate um, everybody's attendance, everybody's participation. Um, so we're very glad to have you here. Um, so now we'll, we're going to have some closing remarks from our hosts. Um, so I'll turn it over to Bob Hansen from UPSIA. Wow. So do you have information overload like I do? Now, what I do when I have information overload is I try to turn out the noise and say, what were my takeaways? And so I'm just going to share them with you. As, as the um, CEO of UPSIA and figuring out where we go in the alternative credential space and also leveraging folks like Jason and other deans and vice provosts around the room and around the country, and figure out how to engage employers and also um, uh, other constituencies that are also represented in this room and, and elsewhere. What are some of the, the top takeaways for me? And and if you begin at 30,000 feet, I think it was really interesting. Some of the, uh, one of the previous panelists was talking about unemployment being at an all-time low. So if it's 3 point, I think it's at 3.9%, it might even be below that. First time since 19, last time it was that low was 1969. I mean, that, when you th really stop and think about that, that is quite an extraordinary moment that we're in. And when you couple with that, so then there, there, that, what that does is create an acute need for talent development, right? The, the war for talent that we were talking about. And then you couple that with, you know, that might have been easier in 1969 because of the pace we were moving at. Now, the pace we're moving at is so fast that knowledge changes, skill sets need change so fast that it creates even more challenge for us to get this right. And you know, selfishly, I, I think we need entrepreneurial units that are at these universities. Some institutions are designed to be that way, like University of Maryland, University Co um, uh, College, um, with robust online programs serving adult learners. So start with that in mind rather than the adults coming later as it does for so many of our institutions, most of our institutions. But I think that's really a great untold story is we've got this, this light that we've been hiding under the bushel at our institutions, even at our institutions sometimes, quite often, faculty don't really know what we're doing out there. So we have these resources that our own institutions aren't leveraging fully that the students aren't leveraging fully, that companies don't really know about. So when companies go to an institution, their assumption is they're gonna deal with the engineering school or the business school, and they are working with them, and there are some success stories there. 
but those, in, those organizations are quite often still not really geared up for the language that we've been using and the mission that we've been talking about. Um, it, it seems to me that, um, that we've got an amazing opportunity to really build on what we've done so far. So Jason and I had some conversations just yesterday. We didn't go in with this at all. But I was, I was intrigued by Jason's use of the term inaugural effort when he was talking about this. Now, the people in this room, we're not gonna change anything. Um, this is a start, this is the start of a conversation. To really move the needle, we're gonna have to scale up these conversations. I learned a lot in the last two days, I'm sure you did as well, about other initiatives that are underway, that are similar. And it seems to me, and I think to Jason, you can speak to that, Jason, when I'm done, but it seems to me that um, building upon the strength of units like, like Jason's, the national and even international reach of, of UPSIA, but mostly national and North American, um, I think we have an opportunity, and, and, and the, 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 the employers in the room and elsewhere around the country, I think we have an opportunity to do something really special. It's gonna be hard work because it's culture change, but it's not as hard as we think because I think there are elements, as I've said, at our institutions that are highly flexible, that are entrepreneurial, that have an access mission that addresses some of the really important sociological questions that recurred during the last day and a half. So I'm really optimistic about this, I'm bullish about this, and I'm just a yes now. Do you think that this conversation scaled up, uh, some of the leaders in the room today, um, could make an impact. Do you think we should take this on a higher scale? Who doesn't think it? Okay, unanimity, Jason. Good luck, I'm retiring next week, but I, uh, no, I'm not retiring next week as far as I know. Well, I, it, was, it was terrific to be part of this uh, last two days. I really it was humbled by the expertise in the room. I learned so much about what I don't know, which is what all good conferences should do. So thank you so much for, for coming and participating. And again, my hearty thanks to our Columbia co colleagues who were terrific throughout. This was really a first class event and we are proud to present it with you. Thank you. All right, so in addition to being a dean here at Columbia, I also teach and I know when a room is overloaded. So I'm gonna keep this really short. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank our partners, Upsia, so Bob, Mar uh, Bob Marley, Bob, Molly, Amy, the whole crew, thank you very much. You've been tremendous partners, and when we scale up, uh, I'm sure we'll do great work together. Thanks to our team, Christine, Pam, everyone. Um, thank you for your efforts as well. Uh, I wanted to thank our board members who have been instrumental, two of our board members in particular. So Stephanie Belrose, thank you very much for your support. Um, and Mike Ulica, who had to leave from National Geographic, you saw him yesterday, so they have been instrumental in this work as well. Moving forward. Uh, a couple things that you can expect. As we said earlier, the Center for the Future of Work here at Columbia University launching this coming summer. If you're interested in partnering, if you're interested in doing research, collaborative projects, teaching, uh, make sure that you uh, engage with us, talk to Christine. Uh, we're looking for all the collaboration that we can get. We also have the book that's coming out, so you've heard from many of the contributors. You can see on the back of your card uh, all the contributors who will be part of that book, so that will be out early next year. Uh, also, we are doing a review of this conference, this forum. Uh, so Dr. Natalie Nixon, Adrian is gonna, is, uh, we had to get an expert uh, to do this for us because we knew we'd be overloaded. So if you have feedback, uh, get her card or get her information. You can give information to her about that, but we will be sharing with you the review of this forum so that we can start to ask the questions about what to do next. So in closing, I wanna thank you all for being here. This has been a tremendous experience. As Bob said, I have a lot of new knowledge on the left side of my brain, but many more questions on the right side. And so we're gonna to start to tackle those and we're gonna be working with all of you to do that. Spread the word that this topic is really important. Uh, I hope you feel the way I do that uh, we've scratched the surface. So let's just keep the pedal to the metal. So thank you all for being here. Safe travels. Thank you.